Welcome to When Gen X Ruled the Multiplex, the films that shaped the MTV generation. Unlike most of the films I've looked at thus far, today's pick cannot really be considered good by any standard measure. In fact, Solar Babies is a very bad film. Entertainingly bad, I'd argue, but bad nonetheless. Solar Babies was directed by acclaimed choreographer Alan Johnson, who'd worked with comedy legend Mel Brooks on the films Young Frankenstein and the Producers, and had directed Brooks in 1983's To Be or Not To Be. Through his production company Brooks Film, Brooks produced Solar Babies, which was written by prolific film and television writer Waylon Green, who'd written The Wild Bunch, and D.A. Metrov, who has written and directed a number of films, but is better known as an artist. Through a series of production mishaps, the budget for Solar Babies exploded from $6 million to $23 million, and it ended up being a critically reviled box office bomb, earning just over $1.5 million during its theatrical run in 1986. On the How Did This Get Made podcast, Brooks said of Solar Babies, Half of it is like pretty damn good, and half of it is like the worst movie I've ever seen in my whole life. This is accurate. Solar Babies opens in the year 41, in a dried out dystopian hellscape after the Earth has been devastated by a prolonged crippling drought. The remaining water supply is controlled by a tyrannical protectorate. At an orphanage, kids and teenagers are taught to obey the protectorate under the leadership of the kindly unnamed warden, played by acclaimed film and theater star Charles Durning, and by the sadistic Stricter Grok, played by Richard Jordan, well known for films like Dune and Logan's Run. Their dynamic is best represented by an early scene in which the warden uses his own precious daily ration of water to care for a small plant, and Stricter Grok uses his electrified staff to destroy it. Solar Babies is the kind of hilariously unsubtle film where the villains have no nuances at all. They are just rotten to the core for no reason other than a love of evil. In the middle of the night, two teams of orphans sneak out of the orphanage and meet in an outdoor arena for a forbidden game of skateball, which is a no-holds-barred lacrosse hockey hybrid played on roller skates. There will be a lot of roller skating in this film. The teams are the evil black-clad scorpions and the heroic solar babies who dress in shades of baby blue and pink. The solar babies are led by Jason, played by Jason Patrick in his big screen debut. They're rounded out by Tara, played by Patrick's Lost Boys co-star Jamie Gertz, Rabbit, played by Claude Brooks, who went on to become a prolific television producer, Metron, played by James Legro, who has starred in films like Drugstore Cowboy and Living in Oblivion, and Tug, played by Peter DeLuise, son of the legendary Dom DeLuise. These days, Peter DeLuise is a very busy television director, but to me, he's always going to be Officer Penhall on 21 Jump Street. Watching the match from a safe distance is Daniel, a young deaf boy and honorary solar baby played by Lucas Haas, who'd established himself as an in-demand child star with his acclaimed performance in 1985's Witness. The Scorpions are led by Gaviel, played by Pete Coenco. Also in attendance at the match is a mysterious and mystical orphan named Darstar, who always carries around a highly photogenic owl, and who is played by Adrian Pazdar, perhaps best known as Nathan Petrelli on NBC's Heroes. The skateball game is interrupted by the arrival of Stricter Grok and the sinister E-Police. The Solar Babies flee, while the Scorpions, who are the not-so-secret favorites of Stricter Grok, stay behind so he can yell at them for not soundly trouncing the Solar Babies. Young Daniel hides from the goons in an abandoned mineshaft, where he finds finds a mystical glowing orb that magically restores his hearing. The orb somehow communicates with Daniel and tells him its name is Bodai. Bodai is a visitor from outer space who, legend has it, is destined to bring water back to the Earth. When Daniel shows Bodai to the rest of the solar babies, Bodai creates a brief miniature thunderstorm that just exists within their clubhouse. Jason consults Bodai on his own, and Bodai shows him a series of images from the climax of the film. The solar babies get the brilliant idea to play skateball with Bodai, so they head out to the court and engage in some utterly mortifying CGI shenanigans. At one point, poor Rabbit has to break dance with Bodai, and I don't know what percentage of that $23 million budget went to Claude Brooks's salary, but whatever it was, it wasn't enough. That poor actor deserved hazard pay. Bodai links all the solar babies together in a circle of mystical energy, and you can almost see all these appealing and talented young actors dying inside at the realization that they are stuck in a very bad and very embarrassing film. Darstar, who has spent the film thus far lurking in corners and looking mysterious, watches them frolicking with Bodai. Later, he sneaks into their clubhouse, steals Bodai, and hightails it away from the orphanage. When Daniel discovers Bodai missing, he heads out on his own after Darstar, and then the rest of the solar babies head out after Daniel. 
Daniel. This whole time, everyone is on roller skates, by the way, and one of the perverse joys of Solar Babies is watching everyone trying to look perfectly natural while roller skating across a rocky desert. Stricter Grok, with his highly favored protege Gavielle at his side, chases down the Solar Babies, who evade the E-Police by playing Crack the Whip on roller skates to build up enough momentum to leap across a giant chasm and land safely on the other side. Meanwhile, Darstar finds his way to the campsite of an ersatz indigenous people named the Chigani, who recognize Darstar as one of their own. He's welcomed into the campsite by a Chigani man named Ivor, played by Terence Mann, who would follow up Solar Babies by originating the role of Javert in the original 1987 Broadway cast of Les Miserables. That's something I just found out this week. I've been listening to that original Broadway cast recording of Les Miserables for 33 years now, and I just put it together that Javert is played by that dude from Solar Babies. Ivor takes Starstar to meet the Chigani leader, a decrepit old man named Canis, played by A View to a Kill's Willoughby Gray. Darstar shows Bodai to Canis, who identifies it as the Sphere of Longinus referenced in ancient Chigani prophecies. He mentions that the Protectorate will stop at nothing to destroy it. Stricter Grok and the E-Police raid the Chigani camp and slaughter everyone except for Darstar, who escapes, and Ivor, who is captured. Gaviel shoots and kills Darstar's owl, in case anyone was still on the fence as to whether he's really a bad guy. Grok tortures Ivor with grisly allusions into telling him about Bodai. For good measure, Grok tortures Gaviel as well, partly to see if he knows anything about Bodai, and partly for fun. The Solar Babies catch up to Daniel at the ruined Chigani camp. They take shelter in a cave where Tug, in his single biggest moment in the entire film, finds an ancient supply of beer. Inside the cave, they find primitive paintings of the E-Police battling the Eco-Warriors, the legendary foes of the Protectorate. At the Aqua Bunker, an enormous bunker containing the Protectorate-controlled water supply, Grok meets with an evil scientist named Chandre. Chandre is played by the fabulous Sarah Douglas, who, after playing the evil Kryptonian Ursa in Superman and Superman 2, became the go-to actress in the 80s for sci-fi films in need of a slinky evil villainess. Chandre assures Grok she'll be able to destroy Bodai. On the trail of Bodai, the Solar Babies find their way to Tire Town, a wretched hive of scum and villainy. The Solar Babies track down Darstar, who gives Bodai back to Daniel. Of all the indignities inflicted upon these poor attractive actors during this film, I think the worst might be whatever is happening to Jamie Gertz's hair during this scene. Grok and the E-Police arrive at Tire Town and shoot everything up, and in the confusion, the Solar Babies lose Bodai. Darstar retrieves Bodai, but gets captured by the E-Police. Most of the Solar Babies escape by climbing inside big tires and rolling down a hill, but Terra is is left behind and is presumably killed when all of Tire Town erupts into a fireball. The Solar Babies glumly continue on their way, only to be captured by a pair of Cockney bounty hunters hired by Grok. Malice and Dogger, played respectively by English stand-up comedian Alexei Sale and Passenger 57's Bruce Payne, both of whom are having way too much fun in this utter shambles of a film. While crossing the desert with their captives, the bounty hunters run into a veiled figure on roller skates who sprays them with water and lures them into an ambush. The woman reveals herself as Tara, who was rescued from Tire Town by the Eco Warriors. The Eco Warriors are led by a man named Green Tree, played by Frank Converse, who turns out to be Tara's dad. They live in an underground utopia complete with baby lambs and their very own iceberg, and they offer to let the solar babies live there. Because Bodai showed Jason the climax of the film, though, he knows there's more to their story, and he convinces the solar babies to join him on a raid of the Aqua Bunker to rescue Bodai. So the solar babies strap on their roller skates once more and skate on up to the Aqua Bunker, where Grok and Chandre are trying to destroy Bodai to prevent it from bringing rain to a drought-destroyed Earth. The forces of evil spend a lot of time in this film working against their own best interests. Chandre plans to do this by using the Terminac, a robot who can pluck the eye from a living bird and is programmed to enjoy what he does. All of this sounds very dramatic and sinister, but the Terminac just turns out to be a big drill and it is unable to destroy Bodai. The Solar Babies infiltrate the Aqua Bunker and rescue Darstar, kind of as an afterthought. Daniel saves Bodai from the Terminac. When Chandre tries to wrestle Bodai from Daniel, her hands catch on fire and she ends up electrocuted by her own computers. Grok captures Daniel, but the malfunctioning Terminac kills Grok despite Gaviel's attempts to save him. The spirit of Bodai enters the Aqua Bunker, and as the Solar Babies skate to freedom, the Aqua Bunker explodes, flooding the land with water. Thunderclouds form and rain falls as Bodai returns to the heavens, and the Solar Babies form their Bodai-induced circle of life once again. Credits roll as the Solar Babies frolic in a newly formed ocean, accompanied by the strains of Smokey Robinson's Love Will Set You Free theme from Solar Babies. Yeah, this film is total crap, right? 
Nonetheless, I think Mel Brooks was onto something when he said that half of it is pretty damn good and the other half is the worst film he's ever seen in his life. It's well shot. It's a really nice looking crap film. The cinematographers and set designers have nothing to be ashamed of. The score is by legendary composer Maurice Jarre, who scored dozens of films during his long and distinguished career, including Lawrence of Arabia, Dr. Zhivago, and Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Across the board, the actors are good. Richard Jordan and Sarah Douglas fare the best, but that's because they understand exactly what kind of film they're in. Stricter Grock and Chandre are having a blast camping it up and reveling in their evil deeds. Everyone is good. Lucas Haas is a treasure. Pete Coenco retired from acting not long after this, but he's a standout just for how much he commits to Gaviel's awfulness. Jamie Gertz and Adrian Pazdar are both strong. Darstar is an utterly ridiculous role, and yet Pazdar, who is a very dignified actor with a low gravelly voice, almost makes it work. Claude Brooks and Peter DeLuise are both in there swinging. Jason Patrick and James Legro clearly have no patience with the film and are just going through the motions. And while it usually drives me crazy to see actors who fail to fully commit to their roles, I'm not going to be too hard on them. If you were a young actor just starting out in your career, it's easy to see how a film like Solar Babies could be tough on your self-esteem. The script for Solar Babies is a hodgepodge of New Age elements and ideas drawn from various religions. The eco-warriors are clearly meant to evoke Christianity, and the Chigani clearly represent Native American spiritual beliefs, and Bodai is a Buddhist term for enlightenment. While there's an interesting idea in there in exploring how ancient belief systems could exist in a far-flung dystopian future, there's no thought behind any of it, and it ends up just seeming childish. This is the core problem of Solar Babies. It talks down to teenagers. Solar Babies has been described by critics as a blend of Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome and Dune, but for teenagers. That idea, Mad Max for teens, is one that easily could have worked, but the film made the strategic mistake of not understanding what makes teenagers tick. Solar Babies reminds me of the long-running Power Rangers franchise, which features a rotating cast of teen protagonists, yet is clearly meant for a pre-teen audience. Solar Babies often feels a whole lot like Power Rangers in its bare-bones characterizations, its simplistic divide between good and evil, and the way that it's grounded in a very basic and kid-friendly mythology. It would not surprise me at all if some incarnation of Power Rangers featured a storyline about magical alien orbs that enjoy breakdancing. I've watched enough Power Rangers to know that would be pretty on-brand. And yet, unlike Power Rangers, Solar Babies is intended to be watched by teens. It's got that PG-13 rating, and the action is fairly brutal, with plenty of torture and violence and grisly on-screen deaths. There's also a running subplot where Gaviel keeps trying to rape Terra, which is something we never saw on Power Rangers. The end result is a tonal disconnect. Look no further than the film's title. Early on, Stricter Grok makes fun of the teen name Solar Babies, calling it soft and weak. And he's not wrong. Teenagers don't want to be babies and it's hard to imagine a sports team made up of teen orphans struggling under the thumb of a repressive regime voluntarily infantilizing themselves by calling themselves the Solar Babies. If you want to gear a film towards a teen audience, it really helps to understand the differences between teens and children. And for all its strengths, Solar Babies never figured that one out, and as a result, teens stayed away from theaters. Next time, we are going to visit my hometown of Spokane, Washington, circa 1985, for Matthew Modine and Linda Fiorentino in Vision Quest. Thank you very much for joining me, and I hope to see you then.